Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time to listen to Guy's wisdom. Uh, it's an absolute privilege for me to hear it as well. Guy founded Sneak, a business that uh, was originally, the idea was to look, for, look and fix open source vulnerabilities in Codebase. He founded it in 2015. It's an amazing business. It's grown to over 1,200 people. It's, it broke through 100 million ARR just over a year ago. So it's been through many journeys, many manifestations. Guy's going to take us on that journey. But one of the things we look for when we're working with great founders is what is the founder market fit? Why is this human being uniquely sort of placed to solve this problem? And I think Guy and Sneak is an example of that. So before we kick off with Sneak's journey, can you just let us know maybe, Guy, like what's the, you know, what did you do prior to Sneak? Yeah. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for uh, taking the time here. Hopefully, there's some uh, useful tidbits here for you to, uh, to take on. So my background, I'm born and raised in Israel, been through the cyber parts of the Israeli army, and then found myself uh, as a software developer within uh, the application security space when it was very nascent, building the first kind of automated penetration testers. So this was an Israeli company acquired by a Canadian company acquired by IBM, and I moved over and became product manager, basically spent the decade in the um, kind of the creation of the app sex space. And we were trying to get developers to embrace, like even back in 2002, I was saying shift left on, on app sec, trying to get developers to, uh, to, to use the products earlier because it's 100 times cheaper to find a problem early versus, uh, versus late in the cycle. Um, but uh, we, we, we didn't quite succeed with that. We sort of got developers to get, get succeeded financially by sort of selling to security people, but not, uh, not, didn't get developer adoption. And then I left and I founded a uh, web performance company that made websites faster in the DevOps scene. And I was a part of the DevOps wave. That company got acquired by Akamai, where I was CTO for a bunch of years. So I sort of spent the next six or so years of my life in the sort of the DevOps space. Uh, and so, and I moved with them to, to London. So really the, the, the two journeys combined a bit in Sneak, you know, trying to bring what I've learned from DevOps into kind of what I've tried and failed uh, to do in, uh, in AppSec. And, and you'd also spent a time actually kind of evangelizing about the space. You'd built a bit of a profile. And it might be that that also kind of helped you bootstrap the early versions of Sneak. So maybe we'll jump into that in a moment. But what's the founding story of Sneak? What was that sort of moment? Was there an epiphany? Or was it just all of these things coming together? Yeah, I think a lot of it is very much the combination of my journeys. And so um, I, I guess from the sort of this stretch of time in DevOps, I've kind of come to appreciate that uh, this need to shift left or sort of run security earlier has gone from a, from a nice to have to a need to have. Uh, the world has split up, teams are, you know, it, like we rely on these fast moving independent teams that build software and security hasn't gotten the memo, hasn't really been adapted to it. And so we have to do it, we can't fix, we can't secure software from the outside more than ever before. Uh, and so th that was needed and then the, the, the DevOps playbook was the inspiration, was to say, hey, now we have, like, fine, we have this need, but also there's a whole horde of great companies that are building amazing tools that uh, get to developers. Uh, and so can we build a security company that is modeled after these great developer companies uh, and, and actually succeed and break through in that sort of holy grail of getting developers to embrace security? So that's the epiphany. Like, the idea literally came to me in the shower, but <laughs> the, uh, the sort of the, the, the path to it was, uh, um, was really these learnings over the, over the different times. Makes sense, but I mean, that is a big problem that you wanted to solve at the point, so you have to make it tractable, and you sort of had an early idea of what the minimum viable solution to test this might be. I think you've got your own description for that. Yeah, I think, so, so the core notion was we want to get developers to embrace security, and that's very hard, and we're gonna model after the dev tooling companies of the world. In fact, we define ourselves as Sneak is a developer tooling company that tackles security, not a security company. So we very much designed everything about the company. The conversations we had around uh, color schemes to sort of make it, you know, warm and welcoming like dev tools. But when I tell you you have, you know, a high severity vulnerability, I want to, uh, I want to scare you just a little bit, you know, like you do need to worry about not fixing that problem. And so doing those, the logo, you know, conversations, you know, like, the, the guard dog, but an animal logo and sort of, so a lot of that, we built the whole company to be like a developer uh, tooling company that's designed on that. And then modeling after dev tools, 
Um, we, we really focused, you know, the, the, I guess the best practice we've seen was taking a specific niche or a specific ecosystem and really, really focusing on that. You see in Eurelic and Heroku, they were built in, in Ruby land and they stayed there for years. So for us it was Node.js uh, and we said Node.js is, is, is the Ruby of that time. You know, it was big enough and small enough, sort of small enough uh, sort of big enough to matter, you know, enough enterprise adoption, enough general use, but small enough that we can be a, a force within it. And so we really focused on that uh, and, uh, and, and, and kind of built, built the tools. And then subsequently, developer security is also massive. And so, as you mentioned before, we picked a specific space, which is open source security, basically finding the timely opportunity of you know, developers being afraid of dependencies. You know, everybody has some horror story about using some library or changing or upgrading, and it broke something. And so uh, helping tackle that problem, which was especially kind of finicky and well-known in the NPM space, in the Node.js space. And so we focused on that. We went very deep. I find myself kind of hustling in you know, every meetup of Node.js meetup that knows me, that, 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 that would accept me. I had some reputation from the performance days, so I was kind of using those uh, where I could. Um, you know, sleeping on air mattresses at Friends, you know, sort of doing these you know, three-person event there and 17-person you know, event there, uh, trying to build it. And we, we succeeded. Like, the first phase of it was very much around being, being a real presence that if you're in Node.js, you would have known about Sneak. Love that. And so sort of phase one was very much founder-driven sales, staying close to the customer. And it wasn't, we often talk about a kind of product market fit. It sounds much more like a product developer fit at this stage or product user fit. Yeah, yeah, correct. And I think, um, so, so a, a core part, so we built this bottom-up motion for in, in security, which generally is a very top-down motion. That, you know, we're going to talk about that a lot more. Um, the bottom-up really means that you focus on the user. And we're saying the whole lens, the whole reason for existence for Sneak is you know, developer-first securities. If, you, if I am a developer and I want to secure the code that I'm building, what do I need? Where do I want to find my tools? What's the company I want to be associated with? But then in the product, the UX, you know, what is it that I, that I need? And so we built the whole product from sort of that ethos. Uh, we built it, I believe, in iteration, and so we, we shipped a crappy little product, you know, <laughs> just a couple of months into the company's existence. We set its beta, we didn't charge anybody for it, you know, and we iterated with the community and we built it up, you know, as I was going to all these different meetups. Um, and, and what we found was, you know, we had a command line interface and we had, you know, as I've been referring to, this, uh, this minimum unit of value. Like our smallest unit of value that we could provide was help a developer write their code, uh, like write secure code. And the smallest version of that was a command line interface that they could download and run locally. And it was freemium because if, you know, it's such an easy action, such a low friction action, that if you introduced a credit card into that, you'd lose a lot of people. Uh, and so we built that, you know, we built the CLI, and we got good adoption pretty much right away. Um, and then that grew, and people would download the CLI would, and, and, and use it. They'd run the, the test, they'd find vulnerabilities, they'd tweet positive things about it, and they wouldn't put it in the build. They wouldn't continue using it. Uh, and so we, um, we, uh, we, we, you know, we dug into it and we talked to them and all that, and eventually we realized we haven't made it easy enough yet to actually get into the, the continuous relationship, the continuous security motion. And uh, our, our, that drove this whole evolution and significant tech innovations that we've had to do, but they came from a product lens, to integrate into GitHub. But really, and, and, and what we've done in GitHub is you do a next, next, next experience, and we figure it out, and we connect it, and we install you know, a, a GitHub OAuth app at the time, you know, install it, and it just automatically now integrates into your workflow around collaborating, around code editing. Love that. And the, the, the beauty of that, what's important to kind of maybe generalize here, is that it made the relationship continuous. So now we did this next, next, next. We still had the CLI. People could still use the even lower friction kind of installation, but then the people that installed it through GitHub, we have this ongoing relationship with them, and we can evolve it. Um, and, and it opened up one more path, sorry for the, the, the long answer here, but it opened up one more path around virality. And so what also happened with GitHub, Snake has always been free for open source, so open source developers could use it. When they used it on their command line interface, it was hidden, nobody saw it. When, the, when an open source developer, open source maintainer, installed Snake as a GitHub app on their uh, open source repository, suddenly it was very visible to all of those that consume that open source project. We would find a vulnerability, and one of our claims to fame was 
we actually fix the problem because the developer's job isn't to find problems, it's to fix them. So we would find a problem, we will package up this fixed pull request, this set of code changes needed to fix it, and we'll open this pull request onto the repository. And then everybody watching, all the open source kind of maintainers watching that repository because they're using it, they would get an alert. And so that really created some virality, and it raised awareness not just to the notion not just the sneak, but also to the very concept that this is a security problem we should work about and that, that worry about, and that this is a type of solution you could get. I love it. So a few few observations just to sort of synthesize that, I think are useful for all of us, including me, as I look at kind of investment opportunities. The first is Guy had a kind of maniacal focus on the right user. So in this case, a kind of product developer focus. We talked about that. He was contrarian in the way he did it because he certainly wasn't out there selling to security buyers like most others. Instead, he started with the early adopters. I think one of the other things that inspired me in what you described is just remembering that actually initial adoption is not the same as engagement. And engagement is often about taking the friction out of using the product. So at this point, you had pretty fantastic kind of you know, developer uh, adoption. I think we started talking together in 2017, and you suddenly hit an inflection point. When we were, at the point we were investing, you went from sort of 600,000 ARR up to 2 million ARR in two quarters from memory. It suddenly just was an inflection point. What was it that drove that? Yeah, so I think uh, as we built this up, uh, we, you know, we got this good success with the developer usage, and nobody would buy. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's a common pitfall for sort of dev tools. And, and so over time, as we've sort of explored that and we learned that, we realized that while we built the sort of the product market fit for the user, we haven't been satisfying the needs of the buyer, which is the security person. Some of that was features, a bunch of different gaps, but probably the most interesting is, is, uh, observation is, is back to that unit of value. So for a developer, you know, they like depth. You know, I'm, I'm coding in JavaScript, and I couldn't care less if you support PHP or not, not because I'm narrow-minded, but rather because I'm, it doesn't affect me. I'm coding in JavaScript. For a security person, they need breadth. They're going to tackle this security risk, and they can't have every director of engineering kind of tackle that security risk in their own different ways. And so they need breadth. They need support for many ecosystems and elements. And so their minimum unit of value was much broader. And so really, fundamentally, we, we kind of cracked the code on developer usage, but then until we've expanded that to multiple platforms, which as a dev tool, typically you care about a lot less, but as a security tool is fundamental, we couldn't really get to that. But once we cracked that and we did it, then, then the momentum of the developer uh, adoption and that sort of tailwind really kind of pushed us up rapidly. I, I love that. So sort of depth for the initial adoption, you then need breadth to get a kind of product buyer fit in this case. Do you... As you look back, I think this is also the point that you started to think about bringing in sales teams. And that profile changed a lot. If you'd thrown, which a lot of founders do, a lot of salespeople at this problem at phase one that we just described, you probably wouldn't have been able to iterate. So how did you think about building a sales team to actually drive? Yeah, so, so it's, first of all, it's worth noting that we did introduce at the end of that beta when we GA'd, uh, self-serve, you know, pay this, thinking the floodgates will open and the developers will now, they've been using the product and now they will happily pay for it, and they didn't. Uh, and we realized that the budget for what we were offering, the organization's budget for keeping itself secure sits with the security person. And so we still get a lot of purchases from developers, but the, the majority of the budget comes from, uh, from security. Um, and, and so within the security industry, the traditional sale is a top-down enterprise sale. But within the dev tooling world, you know, continuing that motion, it's a much more transactional uh, path. And so the key decision was really, I spoke to a lot of different sort of heads of sales interaction. And by the way, before that, we, we hired two salespeople to try and sort of help sell the product without really a big plan. And two salespeople is important because if, they, if you hire one and they don't succeed, you don't know if it's a salesperson or if it's your product that's problematic. So we hired two, and two months later, we separated from one and, and sort of stayed with uh, the other. And that was a really good call. And then once we knew that, you know, the decision was really, you know, we talked to a bunch of different VP sales, some coming more with the enterprise motion that are used to sort of large deals, longer engagements, uh, you know, sort of top-down 
and then the other with someone who came more from a, from a, a transactional background, from a DevTools. And that really helped clarify that for us, we wanted the continuation of it. The muscle we wanted to strengthen in the company was the dev tool motion. And so we built, we prioritized that motion, and we hired someone who was really, really good at this transactional fast velocity sales. Um, and over time, as the company grew and our enterprise motion grew, we did need the head of sales to be someone that comes from enterprise and make that part be a division. And so that's what we did. We sort of got a, a top. Similarly, at the beginning, we, we then brought another head of sales because this one was a bit more America's biased, and the next one was sort of more global. And so each of them was amazing and the right person for the fit. We got pretty lucky there. But, uh, but you have to think about what is the right center of gravity you want to have. And again, it's an example of you just can't skip to the end here. You have to go progressively through these stages. Yep. You, as you kind of thought through the opportunity back then, you would brought in some salespeople, you were creating a hell of a lot of developer demand. I mean, I don't know if you can recall the numbers, but it was huge adoption amongst the developers. And the first thing that the salespeople coming in would think is, these are leads. I remember getting the business slightly wrong back then, thinking, you know, all of these GitHub IDs would be genius because you'd be able to point them to specific businesses, you'd be able to then sell to that business. It didn't work out like that. I learned from that just yep. observing you. So help us understand how you use the sort of freemium community. It wasn't just as easy as picking them off and pointing them at sort of leads. How did you think about that and what did you learn? Yeah, for sure. So we, you know, we, we did, you know, first of all, you know, we, we connect on GitHub and a lot of people use their personal emails on, on GitHub. And so I'd say about half the users probably even to today get their Gmail. So it's oftentimes kind of hard to classify them if you use these enrichment tools to know where they come from. Um, and you know, what we did was we, we took those users and we tried to score them. So we, called, uh, we, we, we took everything we knew. We started from saying everything we know about this user. Okay, like how engaged are they? Did they invite other people? Uh, we did go through the enrichment process. Do we sort of know them? And we tried to get a bunch of these tidbits and give them some score. And if they passed a certain threshold, they became a product qualified lead, a PQL. And that showed up on some salesperson's kind of queue when they decided if to put them onto like a, an automated sort of email sequence or if they want to reach out. And we worked that way. And that helped us, that fed us for a while. Um, one evolution that happened over there was that we, we learned to flip it around. So it's, you know, it, th th this was useful, but it, it was, was a bit of a messy signal. And we've learned that the better way to do it was actually to start from the sales process. So we defined a user profile and we said, when you're trying to assess a sales opportunity, what questions do you want to ask? And then we looked at the data and we said, how best can we answer that? And the key thing for me that was uh, a learning was um, uh, not being afraid to ask. So for instance, because a lot of these users were sort of Gmail users, but the fact that someone used the Gmail user didn't mean that they were assessing the product for personal use versus not. Uh, at some point, we introduced the question to say, hey, are you here for your personal projects or are you here for sort of a business to assess a sale? And we'll help you. We tuned the sort of the downstream uh, 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 workflow a little bit to sort of make it realistic. Uh, and, and that was a really light shed moment for us because, first of all, people didn't run away. I was very afraid of them like, you know, hitting the funnel and all that. It was very minuscule and there was a skip option. Um, and the second is that suddenly our analytics were very different and we saw very different patterns of behavior and we could optimize the personal users for advocacy and spread the word and such and the business users for conversion and it was very significant. And this is an extraordinarily exciting bit of the business because you've kind of taken a vertical approach to appeal to the developers. You've gone broad in order to actually be kind of minimum viable for the buyer, the security buyer, and you've created a sort of product-led growth engine here. So a lot of businesses don't invest that time to create the sort of loop. Instead, they'll take a linear approach where they say, actually, we throw more salespeople at the problem, we have more outbound lead generation, but you created this kind of engine in the business that could really scale. Yeah, for sure. And I think and that evolved itself into, like from the PQLs at the beginning, they were always combined with like some form of outbound, founder-led at first and then with sales, uh, because like when we get in through a developer and they want that depth, sometimes the journey between that developer and the security person that might be sort of signing the check in most larger companies is just harder to do internally. <laughs> so the PQL lets you do that internally, or maybe it's the security person using it. Um, but oftentimes, you know, we'd go outside and engage, and our brand and our broad reputation would help. And at some point, we introduced this notion of product-qualified accounts, or PQAs, 
in which we track uh, 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 accounts that have active users in them, whether they're using it on company code or on their personal code, and then we'd use that in the outbound. And today, that plays a big role. Uh, and, and so the combination, this sort of pincer movement, uh, is important because sometimes it's easier to bridge that gap that way. And I think today, about 70% of the deals that we, uh, that we land uh, have sneak users inside the company uh, uh, that, uh, that have been active. And so it, it's sort of it's a big motion that presence, even when we do outbound, that sort of bottom-up presence is very significant to, uh, to the success. And we, we saw something similar even with our investment in Slack. This sort of you have such a soft landing when you already have product yeah. adoption inside the organization. Now, look, back in 2018, you were signing up these uh, customers, and it was something between $6,000 or $60,000 ACV. It's now potentially multi-millions on many cases. So there's been an, a huge expansion. Is this kind of, does this reflect the third phase maybe where you started to think about customer success, expansion, enterprise sales? Yeah, what does this latest phase look like? Absolutely, I think it's, it's actually the, the evolution of both aspects of the company. On one hand, you know, we've gone from, from the sort of the single developer or development team that's the minimum unit for the user, for the dev user, to kind of a single business unit, which was the minimum unit within uh, security, to, to secure a business unit, and then you know, grew to multiple business units and across. And we have a lot of these examples in which we won over through outbound or through inbound, you know, some company and then another, another, like some business unit, another business unit, and then we go to the mothership and we go broader, uh, especially by the way, leaning into modern companies that have been acquired by a larger company. Those have oftentimes been a good lead in. Um, so that's kind of win one path. And one growth path that's been very significant for us is that developer count we charge by developers. On the other side, uh, we started with open source security as the product, but you know, the vision has always been developer security. And so over, over the years, we've added you know, the container security and infrastructure as code security and code security and, and cloud security now. Now we have five products, uh, and the expansion is very significant, and we're tracking like, the growing percentage of customers with two products, with three products. And so, generally, that was another growth uh, element uh, to us, which is tackle more threats. And I think that's super, super important. One thing I love about it is the sort of the authenticity of it. People expand with you because you are a good solution for them. You're a good company for you to work in. And so all of the investments in customer success in truly valuable product, they pan out. They want to do more with you, and people reach out to us. But also, it's important to assess your market opportunity and understand, is the right thing for you to double down? For us, we believe that the true eventual solution is to, to help developers write secure code. And we don't want to sort of say, help developers write, you know, use open source libraries securely. We want to sort of talk about something broader. So there's big opportunity over there. I love that. One, one thing we haven't really touched on through the course of this is just, you know, partner ecosystem. You touched on GitHub. You went there because that's where your initial user was. You took the friction out of, for them. Uh, how do you think about partnerships, whether it be channel strategy or anything else? Yeah, I, I think, um, so, so it, it's really interesting. And as you grow also, it's super, super important, you know, because you want to get leverage. You can't just grow by throwing more bodies at it. And the product is viral, but you still, you want leverage. Um, ch channel, channel has never been terribly exciting for us. It's a little bit more tricky in uh, like straight up redistribution. You know, there's some of that, but it's sort of less the focus because it's less, um, uh, it's also, in general, it's a little problematic in SaaS. It's sort of, but um, what has been very significant for us is alliances. Uh, and the difference there is that these are actually, when you stop and you think about the problem, not from the lens of your product, but from the lens of the customer, then sometimes you understand that the customer prefers to consume your product through some broader lens. Maybe, maybe the customer is outsourcing all of their security kind of practice around product security to some, some other vendor. And so unless you really want to displace that, you need to fit into how that other vendor provides it. Maybe a developer expects to get their, so we, we partner with GSI companies and security MSSP companies to do that. You know, on, on, the, on the other side, maybe a developer, you know, really, you, oftentimes they want security capabilities to be built into the tool that they're using. If they're using Atlassian Bitbucket or if they're using you know, Docker to sort of install containers, Sneak is built into those, and those alliances come in. And so those are, are very important. It's important to understand that these are slow burners, and you don't control the timeline. So you need to have a lot of balls in the air. You don't really know when would they materialize, uh, and a lot of them are going to drop to the ground. Um, but they're worth investing, and I'd also recommend separating the backlogs. 
it's very hard. You have some pie-in-the-sky vision of some massive company embedding your product. Uh, it may or may not happen, but it's very hard to weigh that against some very real functionality you have to kind of build to close a deal. Uh, and the reality is, in that reality, the like in that situation, the customer needs would almost always win. And so what, I would, what we eventually did and, and really worked for us is to just separate the backlog, resource isolate, how much do you want to invest within the business side, and then have kind of battle and prioritize between different options there, but sort of carve that out of the customer backlog. And that really worked well for us yeah, and I love, continues I love to that. be. I love that um, one of the things that, just to sort of re reiterate something you said, I like your framing around alliances because they're actually partnerships that are symbiotic. And I think a lot of businesses will build a dependency on a third party who don't get the synergy in the same way as they do. You've done a phenomenal job of two things. It's finding alliances where they benefit from the same and are not in competition. And then secondly, equally, kind of as importantly, they're going to celebrate. Look, we have the last yeah. uh, minute and a half together. Final couple of questions for you. Uh, the business is kind of profoundly different from day one when you first envisaged it. it what's actually changed the most? What surprised you the most? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, think, uh, I was a bit of a Puritan around the relationship between product-led growth and, and sales. Like, I think I, I kind of saw them as a bit more binary, uh, and I think in practice they're a lot more symbiotic. And there are a lot of cases, even in the case of Slack, you know, in which if you, if you really want to think about sales as an, assisted, as an assistant, as something that sort of helps a customer figure out what is it that they need, uh, or sometimes helps a champion navigate the organization and close it out. Uh, and so from an efficiency perspective, like, you always want to basically adapt what you are providing to how the customer or the user wants to consume this. Uh, and if you're a techie, if you're sort of a developer and you like your sort of, you know, your products, you know, to be sort of just installed and self-serve, then you have to provide that for them. But if you're engaged with others, for a lot of people, it is actually quite complementary. Uh, there's been like a million learnings, but I'd say in the context of what we talked about right now, that's been a key one. Yeah, incredibly important one. Look, thank you so much for the time. I've genuinely learned a lot, as always. I hope everyone that joined us this afternoon has. So please thank, join me and thank Guy. Thanks again. Thanks, Tom.